Hello, and welcome to the Six Figure Developer Podcast, the podcast where we talk about new and exciting technologies, professional development, clean code, career advancement, and more. I'm John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I'm John Ash. With us today is Aaron Stannard. Aaron is the CTO and co-founder of Petabridge, where they are making distributed programming for .NET developers easy by working on Akka.NET and Helios. Prior to Petabridge, he founded Markup marked up analytics and worked at microsoft as a startup developer evangelist welcome aaron thanks for having me appreciate it so aaron uh, before we kind of get started on the meat of things would you just give our listeners an introduction to who you are perhaps tell them uh sort of how you got started in the industry sure uh well i got started programming uh the age of six uh my dad uh Got a PhD in theoretical chemistry uh, from UCLA in the 1970s. His uh, thesis work was on really early MRI technology. And um, as a result of that, he learned how to do computer programming. And shortly after he got his uh, green card, he came to the conclusion that uh, there was a lot more money in programming than there was in chemistry. So he switched hats and started a software company in the early 1980s, uh, doing uh, some creating things like some of the really early font systems and printer drivers for the Apple II, stuff like that. Things we totally take for granted now <laughs> in 2020, but weren't so obvious back then. Um, so as a result of that, you know, me and my, my younger brother, I was born in 85, he was born in 87. We both got exposed to programming pretty early. And so my earliest memory of doing software was uh, him, my dad, teaching me my multiplication tables by having me write a basic program uh, that could go and print all those out. And I was about six years old at the time. Uh, but then wow. from there, by the time I was about 10, uh, it was 1990, 1995, and the World Wide Web had been out. Our household had had you know, an AOL subscription since about 1988. So <laughs> I could set up a little website for trading baseball cards. Uh, I remember I was really trying to get a, Hide a Hideo Nomo rookie card. Uh, he was the first pitcher to transfer from the uh, Japanese leagues to the American ones. I think he went to play for the Dodgers. And I ended up, ended up making that happen through a little dinky website I made, I think, in Microsoft Word when I was about you know, 10 years old. Uh, but since then, I've always been entrepreneurial, and I've been uh, really interested in building things. So I made a bunch of websites using ASP Classic and VB Script uh, when I was in middle school to use that to pay for my first car. Well, about half of it. My parents had to match me. There's only so much money you can earn when you're 13 and 14 <laughs> doing, doing web development jobs in the mid-90s, you know. <laughs> um, but um, but then uh, but I, I always knew I was I was fascinated with computers, and I really thought the work that my dad did was really cool. And I decided to go ahead and you know, study computer science in college. So I, I went to Vanderbilt University and I got a degree in CS there. And a lot, most of what I learned in college really um, it wasn't all that practical <laughs> from a computer science point of view. <laughs> uh, I mean, I could tell you a lot about uh, the way the uh, MIPS chipset gets translated into binary, <laughs> if you're interested. Um, which actually is, is useful from, um, in terms of appreciating what a modern CPU does. Um, and I, I had some other classes that were useful too. I first kind of learned how to do things like unit testing in college. Uh, and I learned how to do a bit of work uh, with network programming. Uh, so we're using like the ACE framework and stuff like that and C++, which is like a, I don't know, kind of a, a reactive programming library for doing network stuff in C++. Did a little bit of that. And then for some random reason, I got into marketing. Uh, but I think by the end of my time in college. I think it's because around 2007, uh, Facebook's F8 platform came out. I turned around and sold, I was about 21 at the time. I sold my services for uh, beer money, making about a hundred bucks an hour building Facebook apps for people. And I got really interested in seeing which apps did well and which ones didn't. Hmm. And so I kind of got really interested in doing the marketing stuff. I uh, did that for a couple of years, then realized that uh, software engineering is a much higher growth industry than marketing is. So I ended up uh, getting a job from Microsoft when they read about um, some of the work I was doing on my own startup on the side. On uh, I be they basically found me on Hacker News, actually, is how, they, is how I got <laughs> recruited for that job. I wrote a blog post. This is like summer, July 4th weekend, 2010, about how .NET sucks for startups. And <laughs> if, you take a, if you take a look at like the... <laughs> The, the, the heat map of like where all the IP addresses come from, I'd say 50% of them came from a really tight cluster around Redmond, Washington. 
Um, <laughs> so that's how I ended up getting a job as a startup evangelist at Microsoft. <laughs> nice. um, did that for a couple of years. And uh, then I ended up um, starting my own, my own company, uh, which was marked up analytics. We were trying to build um, mobile analytics and marketing animation, uh, marketing automation services for people building apps for the windows store. And this is right around the time windows eight is launching. And I genuinely bought into Microsoft's hype about how the Windows 8 was going to be the greatest developer opportunity of all time. <laughs> and I thought I, I really I, I thought Microsoft was really, you know, onto something there. And boy, the Windows Store was about the biggest train wreck from an economics <laughs> point of view of any platform launch I have ever seen. Um, we had one of our partners, so like the way we were. Well, I might be getting off the beaten path here, but the way we were able to raise money from venture capitalists is I signed up uh, Dell and a couple, and Dell's an OEM partner for, mm -hmm. for us to go ahead and bundle analytics with. So I had a, a signed contract. They weren't paying us anything. They're just saying they're going to require all of their sort of app partners, like Cut the Rope and some others, to use our service. And I had a couple of other OEMs on deck who were interested. And so that's that's sort of how we got we got into the door there. Well, as the company eventually ran out of money <laughs> about two years later, um, I talked to one of those OEMs because I had noticed that they had had, like, the person who was responsible for managing their piece of real estate in the Windows Store had turned over three times in the span of about eight months. Oh, wow. So that's not a good sign. No. And so, he told, so I asked the guy, so he, said, he says, guess how much money we've made off of our little area of real estate in the Windows Store? Bearing in mind, we've sold tens of millions of windows devices and i said i don't know like a couple million bucks and he says thirty five hundred dollars in two years oh. <laughs> <Wow. clears throat> and i was like all right well that that figures why people are bailing out of that job over there pretty fast um so that was that was sort of that that's kind of how i ended up um that's sort of the first i don't know 30 years of my software career there um, the the second half has been that well not the second half but the, the most recent sort of five years uh, when i was working at marked up i you know co-created and open sourced aka.net which is this implementation of this distributed actor model because in order to build our second product which was the the marketing automation stuff built on top of our analytics platform we really needed the ability to make lots of decisions about lots of concurrent users very quickly um i mean we're talking like sub second sort of latencies for making decisions about who should be in this campaign who shouldn't etc what type of message should they get that sort of and we had to be able to do that in a multi-tenant fashion for thousands of different apps um and we really needed a solution that was going to be orders of magnitude faster than your typical crud application in order to do that and the actor model turned out to be a perfect fit for it um so that's kind of how my, I started my second business by accident almost, Petabridge, mm. uh, was Aka.net picked up some traction while Marked Up, my analytics company, was still going. And when I made the announcement that we were shutting Marked Up down because the, the business just failed, we ran out of money, I got hit up with a whole bunch of requests on LinkedIn for consulting for people who were trying to use Aka.net for things like keeping track of buses and major transit systems or mm. trying to use it to forecast the price of energy or you know lots of different use cases. And so uh, Petabridge has turned five years old in January. Aka.net's a little bit over six years old now. And this is definitely a very much an accidental business <laughs> that I'm in. <laughs> Um, so that's the that's kind of the the long version, I guess, of how I got here. Very cool. Yeah. Um, what's uh so what's like a typical day for you uh, today uh, at Peta Petabridge? Petabridge. Well, <clears throat> typical day. Um, you know, it, it depends a little bit. So our business model is kind of a combination of services. So things like uh, consulting, training, support, all around Aka.net. Um, and then we also have some products. We have Phobos, which is this application performance monitoring tool built on top of Aka.net. And then we have, of course, our open source technologies. You know, we've got the, the main Aka.net project itself, uh, which is part of the .NET Foundation. And there's a bunch of people who contribute to it. We've got something like 200 total contributors. But we've got about half a dozen that are pretty consistently active over over like a longer window of time um 
My typical day, it really depends on sort of what our quarterly goal is at any given moment. That kind of is what drives sort of a lot of my focus. So for instance, uh, right now, we're in the midst of shipping Akadonet 1.4, which is paying off a ton of technical debt from when we first started supporting .NET Core uh, back in 2017. So there's a lot of hacky stuff we had to do to make .NET Core sort of 1.1 and all that work. Uh, and they fixed a lot of that when .NET Standard 2.0 came out, but it still took a little bit more time to mature. Um, so, like that's that's kind of our core focus right now. So I do that. Um, I've got a team of a couple other engineers that I manage. So my usually my top priority is making sure that those those guys are clear on what they need to do at any given time, and that they have some um, support in areas where they need it. So like the first thing I spent this mo this morning doing, for instance was spending two hours documenting how all of our build systems work. Because I realized that I'm the only one who really fully understands all of it. And if I get hit by a bus, we're screwed. <laughs> so I spent two hours doing documentation. That was my most urgent thing this morning. Um, and so that's, that's pretty standard. So yeah, a couple hours supporting my guys. Usually they don't need as much time as that, but this is just a little, little different uh, because we're updating the build system all across like a few dozen different projects right now. Um, so that, that was one thing that we did. I usually spend, oh, I don't know, uh, two or three hours, uh, doing some actual coding. Uh, hopefully I can do more than that. If you know, <laughs> that, that'd usually make me happy. Um, and then I typically will spend at least one or two hours doing some customer follow-up. So that's you sales work, reviewing contracts, going through procurement processes, uh, that sort of thing. And then some weeks, though, if I have, let's say, an on-site gig with a customer, I'm flying up to Wall Street to go ahead and train a banking team on how to use Aka.net for doing uh, real-time fraud detection or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do real-time fraud time, real -time fraud detection. They do. But I can show them how to make it really, really fast and how to run it in, mm -hmm. you know, in, with a very high degree of parallelism. That's, that's, what, they, that's what they want me to do. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and basically spend eight hours a day uh, for, well, eight or nine hours a day for three days during that week doing that. Then I'll spend a couple of hours in the morning doing, do, attending to stuff, answering support tickets, that sort of thing. And then I'll spend a couple hours in the evening uh, doing something else. So those days when I'm doing fulfillment activity is really busy. You know, it's not unusual for me to log 45 hours in a week by Wednesday when I'm on the road yeah. doing something for yeah. a customer. Um, it's not like that all the time because that's just not sustainable. Like I, I, I physically would die, I think, after more than – I did two weeks of that in December, and that was physically very taxing. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah. So if, if we could, could we back up just a, a moment and maybe talk about what Aka.net is and, and maybe even go back a little bit further and talk about the actor model in general and, and maybe uses and, and um, you know, why why this is important in in our field absolutely um if you know there's a uh there was a paper that came out around the year i think 2006 maybe 2005 um called the end of the free lunch and what this paper was about was the fact that developers have historically benefited from intel and amd's innovation around improving clock speeds on processors mm -hmm. So every 18 months, your software got faster without you having to do anything. So it's a free lunch for software developers, right? Well, right around that same time, I think it was probably closer to like 2007, 2008 maybe, uh, clock speeds started tailing off, meaning they, they weren't able to keep increasing at the rate they had been. <coughs> and that's because we were running into physical limits of what silicon could do without melting <laughs> at that point. <laughs> so the way Moore's Law has more or less continued is rather than trying to double clock speeds every 18 months, we've sort of doubling total sort of compute capacity by adding more cores or by adding more specialized instructions into the chips uh, that are designed to speed up certain types of operations. Okay. Where Aka.net really plays in uh, is this notion of taking advantage of multi-core architectures and concurrent programming. Uh, there's lots of other programming constructs that have been introduced into most major programming languages over the past 10 years that are designed to help do this. Uh, the most notable one in .NET would be async await and the TPL. That's all about making it simpler to do multi-core programming. But that's really about doing mostly sort of asynchronous flow-driven programming is really what await's all about. 
uh, what the actor model is about is about building applications that are designed to be uh, highly decoupled. Uh, they're meant to be self-healing and they're meant to be capable of being distributed across a variable number of computers. And the number of computers can actually change at runtime. You can add nodes to your compute cluster, remove them without essentially compromising the availability of your software. And that's really where the, where the actor model sort of as an idea originates. And to understand the actor model, we've got to go all the way back to 1973, which is when the actor model white paper uh, first, well, the original actor model white paper first came out. So back then, you know, computer scientists theorized that the types of hardware we would have in the future would be these big living room sized machines running tens of thousands of super low powered CPUs. And thanks to Moore's law, that never became necessary. So the actor model lied dormant for close to 20 years. The actor model kind of became resurgent again in the late 1980s when Ericsson was tasked with building the first digital telephony networks, all the infrastructure that powers the modern internet and modern sort of cell systems. Well, Ericsson needed a way to expand capacity on these cellular data networks without needing to re-architect their software every 18 months. Because they expected this technology would be popular and lots more subscribers would be added in all these areas all the time. So they wanted to make it easy for their customers, people like AT&T and you know, T-Mobile and so forth, to just add, throw more hardware at the problem, scale that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they also needed to make sure that in the event a piece of hardware failed, you didn't want all the calls to get dropped that were all connected <laughs> to that machine. So you needed to have a graceful way of failing over. It turns out the actor model solves that problem really nicely. Because the way actors work is every single actor you can kind of think of as its own isolated microprocess. Meaning it doesn't have all the full privileges and resources that a, a full-blown Windows process would, but it has very similar mechanics. Meaning that all of an actor's memory is kept private from everybody else. So no one can directly read or write any other actor's memory. All the actors are capable of running sort of independently of each other. So actor A and actor B can both execute concurrently, just like two Windows processes could. And then we need to have a mode of inter-process communication. The model the actor model described is message passing, where every single actor essentially has a queue, a little inbox of messages. Hmm. Actors process messages in the order in which they're received. So it's kind of a first in, first out data structure. And so actors get invoked when they have messages to process. And when they don't have messages to process, they just kind of sit there idle in memory. They don't use any CPU at all. So what the folks at Ericsson decided to do was implement this actor model concept using their own virtual machine and their own, eventually their own programming language. And that's where Erlang came from. Erlang is short for Ericsson language. And so in the early 19, well, late 1980s and early 1990s, Ericsson was kind of bringing Erlang back into the, and the actor model back into the fray. And eventually they open sourced it. From there, people started adopting the actor model in industries like online advertising uh, and chat systems. And, you know, you can kind of think of real sort of uh, real time sort of applications that were still in pretty high demand, even in like the 1990s, right? Well, as the internet started getting bigger and bigger, and as users started expecting more real-time programming type functionality in more places, such as multiplayer video games, real-time chat, uh, instant messaging systems, uh, VOIP, that sort of stuff, actors started getting introduced into lots more programming languages, more runtimes, and so forth. All kind of originally deriving from the Spurling implementation. And that's really what Akka.net is. Akka.net is a implementation of the Erlang style actor model in C Sharp. And Alka.net itself is a port of a framework written in Scala, which is a, 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 J, a JVM programming language called Akka. And Akka is kind of the de facto standard for doing actor programming in Java and Scala. Uh, Akka.net's an implementation of that because back in 2013, when uh, myself and the other sort of original members of the Akka.net team started working on this, there was no distributed actor model sort of implementation anywhere on the horizon for .NET developers. It was yet again one of these ways that um, the .NET ecosystem kind of failed to deliver on open source technology that folks in the Node.js or Ruby or Python or Java ecosystem can just take for granted. Um, so that's sort of that's like kind of how Akka.NET really got its start was uh, 
it was a, a necessity that we needed in order to build our um <laughs> build our second product that marked up which is this real-time marketing automation system cool all right so let's say i've got um i'm a you know normal enterprise developer and uh, i've been using async await for a little while and i know you know your standard mostly procedural programming how would i how would i what would i have to change in the way that i'm programming to be able to take advantage of something like uh, aka.net and the actor model sure well the the first thing first thing i'd say is Alkadon and the actor model is very useful when you have, let's say, two out of three problems uh, uh, that I'm about, I'm about to list these problems in order here show up. Um, the first problem you have is that you have, let's say, a guarantee that you have to meet inside your application where that guarantee is something along the lines of we guarantee that every request will be successfully processed within this window of time. And that window of time is typically very short. So good example, if you work in banking and you need to be able to go ahead and guarantee that this transaction will be cleared successfully within three seconds, you have to be able to honor that guarantee regardless of how many requests there are. So you don't get to go ahead and say, we'll honor this guarantee as long as there's less than a thousand ACH transactions per second. Um, if, 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 but, but any more than that, we don't make that guarantee anymore that's gonna cause a major service level degradation. So in that type of environment, you basically have a horizontal scaling problem. That's one thing the actor model is really good at doing is being able to essentially just create more actors on the fly. And each actor would essentially own a little state machine that represents each one of those ACH transactions. And that state machine would have state that's unique to that transaction, such as who the sender and the recipient are and based maybe on rules like the transaction size or the types of accounts it's going to, maybe there's different levels of validation that need to be met, right? The way you process a transaction that has half a million dollars in it is probably very different than one that has five, right? So that's one instance where the active model is really useful. Another is if you have what I call a partitioning problem. Let's imagine you're building, so like a really common use case for Aka.net is IoT applications. So, you know, I'll take I'll take pick one of my customers as, as an example. We have customers who work in oil field services. They have a ton of devices that are embedded inside uh, different rigs and devices that are out in the field, pumping oil or moving it down a pipe or taking pressure and temperature readings and so forth. All that data needs to be fed back into a central app that kind of alerts the field operators. These are the human technicians that have to go out there when there's a problem. It basically gives them signals about how well the field is working and where their attention should be directed. All those different events coming from all those different devices at fairly high frequency looks like a garbled mess when you just take a look at the raw fire hose of information coming in. In order for a programmer to effectively wrangle that and turn it into to useful data and to make it maintainable and easy to understand what's going on, you need to partition that big fire hose of data down into lots of small streams where each stream maps to, let's say one individual device out in the field. Actors are really good at doing that. You might have some central sort of router actors at the very top of your actor hierarchy. Actors tend to be organized into these sort of family tree, like org chart type structures. The actor at the very top is gonna say, okay, well, based on the identifiers at the, tops of, at, the, at the top of this message, I know that this belongs to this oil well, and this data belongs to this oil well. And then at the next level of the actor hierarchy, the oil well actor might say, okay, well, this data actually belongs to a volume sensor, and this uh, data belongs to a, to a temperature sensor. And I'm going to go ahead and just kind of partition this data around. And then finally, the temperature and volume actors might have some business rules on when they need to trigger an alert. So they say, okay, if the uh, temperature has been above or below these, either of these two thresholds for longer than 10 seconds, uh, it means that we might have a con you know, conductivity problem somewhere. Let's go ahead and signal the operators that they need to maybe send a field tech out to take a look at it. Or in the event that it's, at, let's say it's a really severe change in temperature, those actors might decide to just shut down the devices altogether because it might be a safety issue. And you don't want to have to wait for a guy to get in his truck and drive, you know, 
12 miles out into the middle of a field before you do that, right? So that's those are some those are two pretty good uh, ex like specific examples where actors can work really well. Um, where you really don't want to use actors is you don't want to use actors when a, a simple crud op op operation gets the job done. So like you wouldn't see me insist on using actors inside a content management system or a blog or really sort of applications where putting some stateless controllers over a database is good enough, right? What actors really excel at doing is stateful programming, where in order to meet those business rules that you have, let's say we need to guarantee that, you know, within 10 seconds of an anomaly being detected in our oil field services equipment, a human needs to be notified. The only way you can really guarantee that in a bigger and bigger sort of operation is you need to be able to, you need to be able to take advantage of a principle and sort of, you know, software known as state locality, where the code that does the work is adjacent in memory to the data it needs to do it. You don't have to round trip to a database back and forth every single time to figure out if you're in compliance or not. So the actors usually maintain a small amount of state and they apply that to their business rules every time they receive an event that comes in. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. So would you, <clears throat> excuse me. So in that case, would you typically start with that idea in mind on, on like a greenfield project and start with the idea that we need an actor model or, or we want to utilize ACA.net to fulfill this particular requirement or would it be possible to go back and retrofit applications to to incorporate that or or what would you recommend we see well we see retrofits all the time where people need to go and introduce the actor model into an application that's never really had it before uh so a good example we've got a lot of customers that do sort of big data type applications uh and for instance some of the ones i'm thinking of are some of our customers in the financial space where they need to do you know operations that look like either real-time sort of fraud detection, or maybe they need to do something like asset line management, which is a fancy way of saying, is this bucket of 30-year mortgages safer than this bucket of 30-year mortgages if we want to go and you know sell securities built on top of them? Um, those types of operations, for instance, have probably been implemented using, let's say, like batch ETL systems for the better part of a couple decades. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is, is once your volume of data gets big enough, ETL jobs actually become very risky at scale, mm. uh, meaning that you can have what's called a, a, like a top-heavy programming problem, where the day your job gets too big for your infrastructure to handle it and the job tips over, and then you have to try to run it again the next day, but with another day's worth of data applied on top of it, the risk of the job failing keeps increasing over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things you'll see people do is say, you know what? we need to re-architect that batch job into a streaming job. It's the difference between, let's say, shoving an entire Thanksgiving dinner into your mouth all at once <laughs> versus using a knife and fork to eat it bite by bite, right? Same, it's kind of same idea applies there. So that's one really classic example of where you'll see a lot of people introduce an actor model sort of further down the road. They have an application where the business rules are sound, but the infrastructure and the operating model can't scale with the business anymore. And so the, that sort of streaming approach scales a bit better because after you get a partitioning scheme set up for breaking that ETL data down into chunks, all you have to do is just spin up more actors and run, have them run on more cores in order to, be, in order to run the job more quickly. Um, that's one example. Um, typically, what, um, what a lot, like the average sort of ACA.NET use case kind of looks like when someone decides to start using it is they probably end up in the same situation I was in uh, but when I realized that I needed an actor model. And so, you know, my background had been, you know, in .NET development, building mostly MVC web applications, that sort of thing. And, you know, um, I came to this conclusion that, you know, well, in order for us to build this service, we have this uh, real-time processing window we have to work inside of. And man, we tried every which way to make that work by round tripping to a database and doing typical CRUD stuff. And we tried getting clever using caches and things like that, and just nothing worked. And I realized the, the key to making this work was I needed to be able to tell my software to put all the information for each user that we we're trying to process these marketing automation events for. All that data needed to be consolidated into one place. 
And I mean that both in the logical sense, but also in the physical sense. All the data needed to exist sort of side by side so I can make these evaluations really quickly. That meant I needed to have sort of a routing scheme where every single a server that was running my marketing automation code needed to know about every other server. And they needed to have some way of distributing those events back and forth in a mutually exclusive way. And that's what things like a consistent hash router in Aka.net do is they have a formula for being able to take a range of possible hash values where the hash value might be a hash of, let's say, um, your primary key on a record in SQL Server. And they know, okay, anything that belongs in this slice of the hash range goes to server one. Anything in the second slice goes to server two. Third slice goes to server three. Fourth goes to server four. And that way you can go ahead and have all that state build up locally in memory in actors that, that, that basically own the objects whose keys reside inside that hash space there. And that was a concept that was very counterintuitive for me when I was first getting started. Because it's not sort of um, a thing you typically run into you know, at your first job out of college, right? Mm -hmm. um, so where a lot of our users end up running into the actor model is a couple of areas. First is we get a lot of developers who are doing, let's say, some type of network programming. And by network programming, I don't mean HTTP. I mean, they're working with something like sockets, uh, web sockets a lot of the time, sure. uh, or maybe HTTP2 streaming. That communication model really lends itself very well to actors on the back end. It's easy to go and stream um, sort of deserialized messages and then route them to wherever they need to go inside the network. So for that reason, we get and we end up getting a lot of like Xamarin users use Aka.net for, you know, for building uh, apps that have a lot of real-time communication between the app developer's server and the user's client. That's you know one example. Um, okay. so that's one area. And then um, we also see a lot of folks building things like uni like multiplayer Unity 3D games. That's another really popular area for Aka.net as well. Uh, Aka.net is really useful for building NPCs that can follow. Uh, sort of let's say pre-programmed routes and rules uh, if you need to go and route a notification from one player to another uh, when those players are running on two different devices Akadonet's very good at abstracting over all of that okay yeah. um what uh so I, I think you mentioned earlier um some of the dotnet dotnet core and you guys were upgrading what what actually versions are of of dotnet do you do you guys actually end up supporting so Akadonet 1.3 which is sort of the the most recent, well, what, one, we've we've done we've had a few different minor versions, oh, well, a few different sort of revisions of that. Of course, I think we're at revision 17 right now, so 1.3.17. All that stuff targets .NET 4.5 and .NET Standard 1.6. We kind of target both of those. Um, Aka .NET 1.4, which is we just shipped a release candidate of that on Friday, and we're about to ship the finalized version of that. We're going to target .NET Standard 2.0 only, and then I think we're going to add uh, .NET Standard 2.1 support uh, as sort of a, a, a second compilation target a little bit further down the road because we want to take advantage of some of the new uh, low-level you know, low APIs that allow for things like zero-copy access to the socket system and, and that type of stuff. Um, at the moment, we're kind of in an interesting um, spot because... We have a lot of, let's say, startups that use Aka.net and use it for building things like high-frequency trading and video games and IoT stuff. And those, those, those users really care about latency and being able to essentially get the, the most bang for their buck on their hardware, right? On the flip side, the customers that buy our support plans and training tend to be, let's say, Fortune 100 companies and banks and big airlines and the United States government. And <laughs> you're getting, it was a bit of a risk for us to drop .NET 4.5 support, even though that's been deprecated, I think, <laughs> or officially unsupported for like, I don't know, four years, five years now? Yeah. Not five years. No, 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 no. Well, maybe, maybe two or three years. But it's, um, you know, there's this sort of, uh, I guess, conservatism in a larger enterprises. And by the way, it's natural to understand why they're conservative. It's not that they're stupid. It's that... These are their their software is like a multi billion dollar product, and if yeah. something goes wrong with that, you're going to read about it in the Wall Street Journal. Okay. If your dinky startup has a day of downtime, you you'll be it's a good <laughs> thing if someone notices. You know what I mean? Um, so the these these bigger companies have sort of a risk management problem that is 
very difficult to relate to until you've been in that chair, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I understand why they are that way. So one of the things that we do on the Aqua.net project is we survey our users about once a year to kind of get a sense of where their platforms are. And uh, a really positive sign for our ecosystem as a whole, by the way, uh, even, you know, let's say that the really big financial giants, big healthcare companies, insurance companies, all of them want to get on the .NET core and they want to use Kubernetes and Linux and they're trying as fast as they can to get there. Um, in their case, it's just that they need to make sure that everything is, is tested there and back and they need to be locked into versions of stuff for like a year. They can't go ahead and do continuous integration where they roll out 20 releases a day, right? They just, those, those you know, Bank of America can't operate that way. It would uh, paralyze their business. Um, so the, uh, the ecosystem as a whole, I think, is going to eventually match Microsoft's release cadence where things change more quickly. Each change becomes a little bit less scary and a little bit less dramatic. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, you know, I think even the, even the big dogs in the data ecosystem are going to be able to keep pace with that. But we're still in kind of this transit period here where we have one foot in the sort of rapid release camp and another foot in the three-year release cycle camp, you know? Yeah, I was going to ask if, if there were any special considerations for, for library builders and maintainers for the the speed and quickness with which .NET is, is evolving these days. Do you have any, <clears throat> excuse me, do you have any special uh, way or, or of collecting the metrics? Do you have any instrumentations to tell you which features are being utilized so that you can maybe swap out for the latest and greatest implementation and, and hopefully not break others? Well, the best thing you can do is try to go ahead and survey. So like in terms of language features and that sort of stuff, most things are pretty backwards compatible. Like good example, uh, if you want to go ahead and start using a span in memory, you know, those are, those are two brand new runtime features that are designed to help reduce garbage collection, which is a big source of late of, sort of a throughput loss inside your application. Um, if you install the system.memory package, you can be backwards compatible all the way back to you know, .NET 4.61 if you want. So you, there's a lot of features you can get for free without really giving up much in the compatibility department. Where that becomes less true is the closer you get to, let's say, native interfaces uh, exposed in .NET. So a good example of that, if you want to use, let's say, a zero copy uh, socket API that, that uses span and memory under the covers. You can only really get that if you target .NET standard 2.1 or .NET core 3.0 and up. Uh, and that means that all your users who are still running on .NET framework are just kind of sitting there twiddling their thumbs to some extent. So you end up having to support two different implementations of your network stack. If you want to go ahead and support those users running on an older version of the runtime, but also give your users who want speed uh, a cutting edge experience. So you have to kind of strike a balance somewhere. And, you know, truth, truth be told, it's uh, not that hard to do both if you're very good about abstracting the area, like anticipating where are the areas where I'm going to need to change strategies. Uh, you can kind of think of it as like a compile time strategy pattern almost, uh, executed using largely if def statements and that type of thing. Um, you know, we had to do a lot of that to support .NET Core 1.1 when it came out because so many APIs got removed uh, that getting a basic piece of functionality like reflection to work <laughs> was, 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 a, was a little bit laborious back then. They, they kind of rolled a lot of those changes back in .NET Standard 2. So a lot of those APIs that got removed were, were reintroduced. Um, but... Um, by and large, with the way they're kind of managing the API surface area now, it's, it's a lot easier to figure out which changes are not going to be able to go back in time and which ones are. And it's usually the, the interfaces that kind of touch um, native components inside the system mm-hmm. are the ones you need to be the most wary of. All right. Okay. And we've got a question from Twitch. Uh, oh, what, all right. what is the biggest deployment of Aka.net that you've seen in terms of node and core count? Um, I don't know what the core count is, but the biggest one in terms of node count I've seen was a payments processing company that had a sca- a flexible size cluster on AWS that ranged anywhere from 300 to 800 nodes, depending on the amount of traffic they were running. So these were all, I think, on 
it was either EC2 or ECS. I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember which. That's the biggest one uh, I've ever seen out in the wild before. Typical cluster sizes in terms of stuff that I see on a pretty frequent basis. Um, I've got one customer that is running a cluster that's in the 512 core range. Um, and but they're, they're they kind of have a very vertically scaled application in terms of they're they're running some pretty they're doing a lot of like real time search type stuff against a fairly complex matrix it's like price searching that sort of thing um, so they they have a copy of their search graph sitting in about sixty four gigs of RAM and about sixteen cores for each one of the nodes that does that um, so that's that's the most I've I've kind of seen from a recently from a core count perspective. And then um, typical cluster sizes, I'd say between 25 and 50 nodes is probably about the typical one that I run into in terms of like a bona fide production deployment that's serving real traffic, uh, about that big usually. So, yeah. So not gargantuan uh, in terms of, you know, I think on the JVM, um, Scala Aka, I think some of the biggest clusters that are just floating around being used in production, I think they're like Google applications and stuff like that, are in the neighborhood of about 3,000 nodes. Mm -hmm. um, so I've never seen anything that big in Aka.net. Um, but you never know. Might have, might have someone out there running a big MMO or something that I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Yeah. clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so switching gears just a little bit. Um, Earlier, you had mentioned that you were working for Microsoft and, and some other th uh, things, and you made a switch from, from basically corporate to startup and, and open source. Um, what considerations did you have to take in before making that switch, and how did you manage the fear of, you know, I mean, kind of jumping almost without a parachute there? Well, um, the trick is to have a parachute. And in my, in my <laughs> case, it was I was... 24 when I started working for Microsoft and I quit two years later and I was 26. I didn't have uh, a lot of things to spend money on at that age. So I basically built up a pretty good, a pretty solid bankroll uh, in terms of like, any bonus I got from working for Microsoft. It just went straight in my savings account. And I never touched it. Um, so I was pretty judicious about building up, uh, building up some money to, because I, I knew I wanted to start a company. Um, so I was very judicious about saving that up. And the advice I've given to other people who are interested in going into business for themselves and don't want to, well, don't think they can go out and raise money right away. Uh, my advice has been either try to go ahead and work on your business in your spare time, essentially you know, do it 10 hours a week or something like that until you can get a working prototype and you can go out and prove the concept. That way, you know, particularly if you have a family that you're supporting, uh, you're not exposing all of them to a ton of financial risk right away, right? Mm -hmm. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it, because there's some businesses you just can't do 10 hours a week. Uh, it mm -hmm. kind of really depends on sort of what the nature of it is. If you need to go full time in order to test out the proof of concept, my second strategy, and this is what I did for myself, is I built up about 12 to 18 months worth of financial runway. We're at my current level of expense, assuming I didn't cut anything. And I could go that long without receiving, you know, a, a single dime back. And that, and then you, then you set a limit for yourself and say, if I go for this many months and it looks like we have no traction, that's the point where I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to call it and I'm going to come crawling back to one of my, one of my friends who works <laughs> for someone else. Or I'm going to go back to Microsoft and that, and I'm going to go ahead and rethink it and try again later. Um, yeah. So you want to go ahead and try to try to prepare yourself. Uh, the other thing that you can do, is you can try to lower your expenses or eliminate potential uh, things that can go wrong. It's like one example, uh, right before I quit Microsoft to start my first company, I was driving this BMW 3 Series that I absolutely loved. And the warranty expires about uh, maybe about, I don't know, seven or eight months uh, before I was, I was thinking about um, leaving Microsoft. And I get hit with like a $5,300 bill to replace a gasket that went out about four weeks after the warranty went out, which seemed suspicious to me. And I, well, here's the thing. So I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to leave and start a company, I can't deal with like a $5,400 expense <laughs> just out of nowhere. Um, so I went ahead and I traded that car in. I got a Toyota that has like never needed service basically after that. You know, I, I so I went ahead and I had, to, I had to pay some money up front to get a new car. Um, of course, but I figured 
that way at least I'm kind of on a predictable track uh, when I'm when I'm starting my company here where I'm not going to have I called it an asteroid expense. And one of my <laughs> friends asked, what does that mean? He goes, well, imagine an asteroid comes out of nowhere and blows up your house because that's an asteroid expense. It's like there's no way you could have predicted that, that was going to show up. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, trying to go ahead and reduce your surface area or some of that stuff. But then mostly the, the those are the financial considerations. The most important thing is, will you be happy running your own company? And I think there's a lot of people who think they will be, and then they try it and learn that it is not for them. Um, you know, one of the things that that's that uh, the reality of running a business is very different from uh, the fantasy of it. The the fantasy is that. I think the fantasy of it is that dude, that that stupid TED Talk headpiece you see people with their, in their LinkedIn photos <laughs> being up there talking about what a great success you are. Whereas the reality of it is um, sitting down, having to handle really complicated taxes at 11.53 p.m. on April 13th because you got 48 hours to get your K-1 submitted and so you can, you know, and all, all this other type of stuff. And um, it's... There's a lot of basically it, being the janitor basically is kind of like most of what your job is when you're first starting a company. Uh, it's not very it's not very gl- glamorous, and you have to be willing to kind of tolerate that in order to get to the parts you really do like. I like building things. I like uh, leading people. I like as a team accomplishing hard stuff. Those are the things that I really enjoy. I don't like sitting through presentations on benefit selections for <laughs> for employees and things like that. I'd rather I'd ra- there's a there's, I can think of many different surgical procedures I'd rather undergo <laughs> one of those. But, you know, I do it because ultimately it helps take, helps me take care of the, the people on our team. Um, and then the, the other bit is the how do you know if it's going to work? The sort of that's the psychological part of it, right? Um, I'm, you know, in terms of if there's any single piece of super good luck I can point to in my own life, it's that my father was someone who – Grew up in a government housing project in the UK originally. Uh, you know, my my grandparents hung wallpaper for a living. You know, pretty working class. And my dad ended up being a, a successful tech founder himself. And I kind of got to see him do that as I was growing up. And don't get me wrong, his first company went bankrupt around the time I was two. So you know, there's there was um was wasn't all success and 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 the high flying stuff. There was some some definite low points there too. But I, I basically I had a chance to see someone do it, so I knew I could do it too. I knew it was po- like possible for me. Um, that was really helpful as well. Um, one of the things that'll help you out a lot if you do decide to, to become entrepreneurial is find some other people who are at like the, roughly the same stage of starting a business as you are, um, and then also find some people who are a little bit further ahead too. Uh, the first group, people who are in the same league as you. They're your emotional support group. <laughs> these, are the, these are the people going through some of the same crap you are. They're, they're going to be your sympathetic ear. They're going to be your bar buddies and all that sort of stuff. The second group, the people who are more experienced, they're your mentors. They're going to be the ones who, oh, man, let me take a look at your uh, contract. Oh, well, dude, this is dumb as hell. That's why you're not getting any <laughs> deals closed. Don't, don't you know you've got to do X? You know, it's like <laughs> um, it's, it's useful to have people in both groups. Um, and uh, I think you want to have a healthy mix of both. Uh, I'm, I'm really lucky in that, um, you know, I, I, could all, I could ask my dad a whole bunch of questions. He, he was definitely someone in that second group. But in the first group, I ended up uh, finding a whole bunch of folks in L.A. when I lived there. And I, I found a bunch in Houston where I live now, too, who are all kind of going through the same thing. Uh, people who've, got, who've had a bit of success for their business, but they're not exactly Facebook yet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's, it's useful to have both groups around because you can learn lots of different things from each other. Um, so yeah, cool. How about uh, resources for people that might be looking to get started with uh, Aka.net? Sure thing. Uh, is, there any, is there anything that you could point people to? Uh, yes. Uh, I'll go ahead and drop some links in the uh, Zoom chat here. Uh, but the first thing I can think of is we have the Aka.net Bootcamp, which is kind of like a self-paced course uh, that teaches you how to use the ACT model, teaches you the Aka.net syntax, and it's kind of a learn-by-doing type, uh, type class. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's kind of going to help teach you the Aka.net basics. Uh, we also have a second course, which teaches you all of the distributed programming stuff with Aka.net. It's mm-hmm. so like building a real networked application. Uh, it's kind of works works using a uh, similar technique. 
And then on top of that, I think there's in the neighborhood of between 12 to 18 plural site courses on Aka.net. Uh, I didn't make any of them, so if they suck, it's not my fault. Um, <laughs> but no, we, we've had, we've, uh, and all kidding aside, uh, a lot of the folks who've ended up becoming uh, big Aka.net users or Petterbridge customers have often told me that they, they first found out about us through the plural site course, really enjoyed that. And that's kind of that was that gave them enough to go ahead and really get started with it. So if you have a portal site subscription, that'd be a good place to start too. Cool. Then I'll go ahead and drop these links here. Uh, Learn Aka.net uh, for Aka.net Bootcamp. That's one. And then let me grab a link to our clustering course. Apologize for the keyboard noise in the that's background bad. here. All right. And then, uh, once you get finished with that one. One last go. question um, for, for our listeners who maybe want to reach out to you or follow you. Is there a particular social media or a place that they can do that? Uh, the best place to do that, to reach out to me directly would be Twitter. Uh, my handle is Aaron on the web. Very old school. I'll go ahead and type that in there. Uh, Aaron on the web is the best place to reach me directly. Uh, now, if you have Aka.net questions and I'm not available, um, I do like to try to sleep eight hours a night. Um, <laughs> If you can get, get a hold of me, if you go to getaka.net, I'll go ahead and type that in. Uh, there's a link to our Gitter chat in there, which is a chat room that has about 1,600 Aka.net users in it at any given time. Uh, so you can get a lot of questions answered in there as well. Awesome. All right. All right. Very nice. Thanks, Aaron. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak with us today. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, looking forward to... Uh, Looking forward to, to getting some questions from your from your listeners, and uh, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Sure thing. That was Aaron Standard. Aaron is the CTO and co-founder of Petabridge, where they are making distributed programming for .NET developers easy by working on Aka.NET and Helios. Prior to Petabridge, he founded Marked Up Analytics and worked at Microsoft as a startup developer evangelist. If you like this episode, please like, rate, and review on iTunes. Find show notes, blog posts, and more at sixfiguredev.com. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at sixfiguredev. This has been another episode of the Six Figure Developer Podcast, helping others reach their potential. I am John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I'm John Ash.